All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin at the end um, just because I wanna make sure I get to play this thing. Uh, watch the kids when the music starts playing. Yo. Hi girls, it's August 6th, is that right? Yeah. August 6th, 2012. Daddy's gonna play them a little song while they're you eating their peas. Ready? You guys ready? Okay, so um, what I'm gonna be talking about is about sound processing in the brain. And just to give you a little bit of a, of a preview here, um, so here you can see a baby crying. Now you can hear the baby crying. I need a little more sound here. Let's go make this really loud. You're gonna hear the baby. Um, and people with musical experience, when you measure their sound processing in the brain, are better able to pick up on this complex part, the emotion-bearing part of the cry, which tells you if the baby means it or not. Um, and and, and, and the, the non-musicians actually uh, process more excessively the parts of the sound that are, are simple, and they're holding on to that uh, because that's, that's what they got. Um, so now I'm gonna scooch back to the beginning here. Title slide. So I get to talk about biological benefits of making music. And I start with sound. So sound, sound is invisible, yet it is one of the most powerful forces in our lives. And many powerful forces like gravity and electricity are invisible. Uh, sound is pretty important for human communication. Now, grass is moving, and this animal has to figure out whether the sound is something it should go towards or flee. So it's essential to survival, and, and it's essential for our engagement with each other throughout our lives. So our life in sound very much modifies and influences how our brain processes sound. So you can have a language impairment, uh, you can have a linguistic deprivation, we can just be getting older, um, and this can lead to poor listening skills. And at the same time, we can do something like play music. So this is an, an auditory enrichment experience that uh, will boost aspects of sound processing in the brain to help us make sense of sound. And our brains are really this combination of our life in sound for better and for worse. Um, so when we look at sound processing in the brain, we measure with scalp electrodes, uh, we have sound processing that happens at multiple time scales, similar to sound waves that also happen at multiple time scales. Um, you know, you can think of uh, the rhythm of footsteps, the crunch of leaves, a little faster, the snap of a twig, faster still. So these are the sound waves, and we're interested in how it is that the brain waves represent these aspects of sound processing. And I, I don't know if, if any of you heard the, the, the presidential lecture on, on, so, on songbirds and how, um, you know, the, 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 the nervous system really learns through social engagement how to process different elements of sound, and this is really something that um, all species do. I'm especially looking at this fast sound processing because this is something that we've only recently been able to have access to. 
So how do we measure sound processing? We put scalp electrodes, and here's a sound wave, here's a brain wave, and you can see that the brain wave actually physically resembles the sound wave, which is very unusual in neuroscience, where your assay actually looks like the thing that you're wanting to, 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 be, to be studying. Um, and you can also take that sound wave and the brain wave that it produces, take the brain wave and sonify it. So in the same way as I can take the electrical signal from my electric guitar and put it through a speaker, I can do that with the electricity that I measure from your brain. So here's a sound wave. Da. Here's the brain wave. Um, some more examples. Da. 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 Scale, brain, brain's response to the scale. We'll skip Mozart, go right to Deep Purple. Okay, so the point is we have, we, we really, as neuroscientists, we have a tremendous amount to work with in terms of the processing of sound details. And so we are able to measure different aspects of sound encoding. And the reason I've got a mixing board analogy here is because each one of these ingredients of sound processing works independently. So if you happen to have expertise, um, you know, it might look like this. A person with deprivation or um, disorder might have a brain that looks like this. But each one of these elements operates independently, so it's not a volume knob effect where everything just goes up and down. So each one of us has a brain that can uh, process in a default mode certain ingredients better than others based on our experience. And really one of the, the frontiers of neuroscience is to be able to look at our individual differences. Look at us, we all look different. Um, and our brains work differently. And, and we can today access the individuality of sound processing in the brain. Uh, we can look from a single brain response at, you know, we can do a fast Fourier transform and look at the strength of the fundamental frequency, the strength of the harmonics. We can measure the brain's response to two sounds, say ba and ga, and see whether the nervous system can tell the difference between these two sounds and by looking at phase differences between the electrical signals. And the more red here, the better that individual is at distinguishing those sounds. Um, we're especially interested in looking at the timing that happens in response to consonants, speech consonants in noise, because those are especially vulnerable. Did I say bill or pill? Um, and we want to look at stability, at uh, the stability of sound, uh, how it is from trial to trial. So, um, making sense of sound really requires that uh, an integration of systems. And so we're looking at systems that I, we think of as distributed but integrated. Uh, sound enters the, the, the brain and importantly, you know, we really have had this paradigm shift in neuroscience where we have um, more fibers that are going downstairs than upstairs that are informing our hearing system as uh, we engage with sound. And uh, so our sound processing is informed by how what we know about sound, our cognitive, our sensory motor, and how we feel about it, our reward system. Now, I want you to listen to this sentence, see if you can hear a sentence. Anybody get a sentence? This is the sentence in there. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Now listen to the first track. So do you believe me? Yeah. So what we know about sound influences how we automatically hear it. And, uh, you know, this, this brain response to sound that enables us to look at very, very, very fast processing of sound 
is, uh, we call it the frequency following response, and it's actually coming from the midbrain, because the midbrain is the area of the brain that does some of the most computationally complex and fast things that we ask our nervous system to do. Never think of it as being primitive. The midbrain is a hub that is getting information constantly informed by multiple aspects of the sensory, cognitive, and reward network. And music, of course, is a jackpot for engaging our sensory, motor, cognitive, and reward system. Okay, so how can we use this information? Uh, linguistic deprivation is a form of our life in sound, and it often accompanies poverty. We know that maternal education um, tracks with linguistic deprivation, where kids whose moms have less education tend to hear five million fewer words than kids whose moms have more education. So what we did is uh, we tested Chicago area high school kids, and these are kids who were all coming from low income areas. Uh, they all qualified for subsidized lunch. They were educated in the same classroom. And what we did is we divided them simply based on their mom's education. And what we found when we looked at how their brain processed information, we found that, well, first of all, in the absence of any stimulation, the kids whose moms had less education had more neural noise, whereas in addition, when we played sounds, two very essential ingredients for distinguishing and understanding speech sounds, the harmonics and how stable the response is from trial to trial. Because you can imagine that if the brain does not respond in a stable manner, uh, you know, how, how is a child to learn? So I, I find that a radio analogy works pretty well. I mean, imagine if you are listening to a radio and they're static. And on top of it, the answer's voice is kind of muffled. It's going to be difficult to understand what's going on in a room. So we have this signature for linguistic deprivation, which involves specific ingredients. And now you know, we have that knowledge of what specific ingredients really track with linguistic deprivation. And what we've been able to find is that music, that making music well, it can't fix the problem, but it can partially offset the impact of linguistic deprivation on the brain, so that you have then a brain that is stronger and better able to make sense of sound as far as its default processing of sound goes. So we've done a number of neuroeducational projects, one in the Chicago area, where we've looked at high school kids, and the other in Los Angeles in the gang reduction zones of LA. Uh, here, we looked at nine to 12 year olds, here second to fourth graders, and the long and longitudinal is no joke. Um, you know, we followed these same kids year after year after year. And uh, you know, one of the aspects of poverty is the achievement gap, which gets bigger, widens from year to year. And we wondered whether music might help offset this achievement gap. And what we found was that when we looked at reading scores, um, you know, the kids who did not have music, uh, they did continue to follow this uh, achievement gap, the decline that one might expect. Um, whereas the kids who were engaged in the music making programs, um, they maintained their reading scores. Um, so in both our grammar school and our high school kids, we found that music training strengthened or at least tracked with the kids who played music as opposed to our controls. We had um, active controls and passive controls um, that uh, reading related skills improved in the kids who played music. Um, and also the kids who played music uh, did better in terms of their ability to listen in noise. Um, from a biological standpoint, we know that the auditory system, and now we're looking at cortical 
uh, responses, we know that they have a very well-established maturational time course. And we were able to determine, and this work has recently been replicated by another group, um, that kids who were engaged in making music um, showed faster maturation of this auditory cortical system. Um, we also found that the sound processing of particular ingredients that we know are important for language were strengthened in the kids who played music. So another lesson, another discovery, is that it takes time. So after one year of music training in both the Chicago cohort and in the Los Angeles cohort, we saw no changes in the brain's response to sound after playing music for a year. It, it took two years. After two years and then progressively, it was cumulative. Um, but it takes a while. You know, the nervous system, we can't have a nervous system that changes fundamentally every second. It takes a while to change a nervous system fundamentally, which is why you know, speaking another language for many years really has an impact on sound processing in the brain. And uh, it takes effort. The more active the child was, in, the more engaged he was based on teacher reports. Um, it wasn't how, how good they were. It was really just how engaged they were in the process that was important in terms of the changes that we saw biologically. So we know that language and music abilities coincide. There's been a lot of research that has, has shown this. Um, but you know, again, from my perspective, in looking at this very, very objective, and I, I, love, I love signals. I, I, look, I, I look at sound signals and brain signals, and you can look at something complicated like, like reading and emotion, but, but you're looking at it in a very objective manner where you, you know, one and one is two today and one and one is two tomorrow. And uh, we can really see that these aspects of sound processing that are important for language are strengthened in individuals who play music. And we see this across the lifespan. So listening amidst other sounds and identifying sounds is something that happens rather inherently when you play music. Um, and so one of the questions that we asked was whether um, this ability would transfer to speech. Would it be the case that you would be better able to hear your friend's voice in a noisy place if you had musical experience? And in fact, this is the case. We saw this across the lifespan that people who um, actively engaged in making music, and we're not talking about professional musicians, um, were better at hearing sentences in noise. You know, a, a sentence like this. Kind of hard, right? So these are standardized measures of, of hearing a noise. Um, and again, beautifully, you can see this in the brain responses to sound. So you can see that in quiet, the musician and the non-musician are not that different. But in noise, the musician, the response is almost as good as in quiet. And you, can, I, you don't have to even do some of the very fancy analyses that we do uh, to see that the non-musician has really taken a hit here in the noise condition. Auditory working memory inherently is important in music. Uh, just to tune your instrument, you have to remember what the sound sounds like. If uh, I'm going to improvise with you, I've got to remember your musical idea if I'm going to improvise. Uh, and this is a very important skill. As you're listening to me right now, you've got to remember what I just said a few seconds ago to make sense of what I'm saying to you right now. Um, and, and it's been shown by a number of labs that um, auditory working memory is strengthened it is stronger in people who actively engage in making music. So um, making music then is a lifelong investment. Um, and as we get older, one of the things that can happen is we can get hearing loss. And we know that hearing loss can accelerate cognitive aging. This is work by, um, by Frank Lynn. Um, and, and so I showed you this, these data before, that hearing speech and noise and auditory working memory is better in people who actively engage in making music. But what about older adults who play music? 
what we see is that the older adults who play music and have a hearing loss, even though they have a hearing loss, their performance is better than their age-matched peers who have normal hearing and don't play music. Okay, so music really does engage this cognitive sensory motor reward system that makes us better at making sense of sound. Um, as we get older, what happens is that our neural responses to consonants, especially the tricky fast parts of sound, slow down. If you are an older adult musician, um, your neural timing is very similar to that of a younger person. Um, that stability decreases generally as we get older. An older adult musician is uh, pretty good. We look at neural synchrony and phase locking. This diminishes as we get older, not in an older adult musician. And finally, the harmonics, something that diminishes as we get older typically, but an adult, older adult musician uh, has very strong harmonics. So you really have, here's a young, young, young adult and an older adult and an older adult musician, and you see that you have a biologically younger looking brain. And importantly, this happens, I mean, how many of you played music sometime in your life and are not playing it anymore? That's the case. But the fact is that you played it in your life and this was a lifelong investment because you're, you learn to make these important, precise sound to meaning associations that you carried with you and reinforced in all kinds of interactions with sound throughout your life. So um, to sum things up, uh, I think we can really say that STEAM objectives are scientifically supported. So bringing arts into a well-rounded education, we have scientific evidence for this. Um, and it strengthens brain function for learning through sound. Um, we can use music to help offset the impact of linguistic deprivation. Uh, it lasts a lifetime. It takes time, it's not a quick fix. Um, and importantly, you know, what next is, uh, you know, our, our call to action is that we can really use, this is a society for neuroscience. We should be able to use biology to inform social change. Um, so to, to, to move, to have um, evidence-based biological outcomes to strengthen music in education and health across the lifespan. Um, and of course, research funding is, is essential for this. Um, and you know, I, I think it's important, the way forward is uh, to lower the cost of doing the research and have more people doing the research. And so I, I get oceans of correspondence from, from people wanting to make these measurements of sound processing in the brain, and it's, it's expensive and complicated. Uh, but we're working on making a, a user-friendly, uh, more affordable uh, device that a, a teacher could use to inform their educational practice. Um, because it's knowledge, right? It's really knowledge that can empower uh, scientists, clinicians, policymakers, teachers. So um, these are the folks in, in my lab, and they do all the heavy, heavy lifting. <laughs> um, and here they are again, and in particular, um, Travis Whiteschwak, Jen Crisman, Trent Nickel, Elaine Thompson um, have been uh, very instrumental in the work that I talked to you about today. And uh, I would like to invite you, please, to visit our magical website. I've got uh, some cards up here. Um, and you know, if the science can be used to um, strengthen art policy, uh, I would be very, very happy. Um, and so each one of these uh, areas, if you just click on it, you can start with a friendly overview slideshow that will sort of give you an, a sense of what we're doing with each one of these topics. And also on the home page is a little video of our biological approach if you're interested. And thank you. <laughs>